I go, yeah. And you go, what? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> and now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. You suck. <clears throat> I believe your line is, hey everybody. Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another Dune Steef. <laughs> this is just a Dune Steef, right? It's not how that gets my goat. Right. It's That's weird. We're on alien turf right now, aren't we? Kind of weird. Here with me is my co-host. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, this is Rish Outfield. And uh, today we're bringing you the second half of Ship of Fools, right? Yeah, it's at long last. Ship of Fools, second half is here. Yeah, and I, you know, I apologize. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> huzzah! Oh, huzzah. That, there you go. I feel bad that it's been so long, but uh, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's... Unfortunately, it's just the way things have been. It's harder for us to get together than it used to be, but we make do somehow. Sorry you may have to re-listen to the last episode, but that's okay. It just gets us double the numbers, right? Oh, see, I wouldn't know anything about that. I don't see the numbers. I, I don't but, either. Uh... I don't even know if that would count if you would get a second download or whatever, but... Well, why wouldn't you? Oh, does it only count downloads? Yeah, I think it counts downloads. So most people probably would just re-listen to the file they already downloaded. I don't know. Okay. Maybe if they streamed it on Stitcher again. Uh, so, I, you know, I do apologize to everybody who was excited about the second half of this story. And we said that it would be soon. And it wasn't. But, uh, you know, it just it took me a long time to edit the uh, story. Put all the voices together and get that file to you. And get together with you and record the episode you're hearing now and edit that and get that to you and wait for you to post it. So <laughs> there we go. Well, you can't rush quality. I think that was a, uh, a slogan for something. I don't remember what it was. I wonder if I could find that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't search it. That's you can't rush quality. Is that really a, a saying? <laughs> Baby fish mail? I don't know. We're going to find out. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. It's not really a slogan. Oh, the cat's eating it. <laughs> um, okay, so... You can't you know, rush art. That's what that guy says on Toy Story 2. Okay. When he fixes up Woody, the guy with the, the, the cleaner. Ah, the, the, the Jerry's that? Game guy. Yeah, and he says, you can't rush art. So there we go. We'll go with that one. I was quoting Toy Story there. You can't rush art. Well, that's that, that's good. Um, I, before we play the story, uh, is there, can I take a moment? I need to make an announcement. Okay. So, um, you know that I have my own podcast, um, the Rish Outcast, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, which is a yes, I know, I know about it. It's a knockoff of the show that you do in your car. What well, did in your car? <laughs> and then, yeah, occasionally I have a podcast that dares not speak its name. I, I would like to say what it's called, but you know, contractually, I can't. You dasn't. I dasn't. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of those episodes, and uh, those episodes, they just come out when I want them to, and I do them by myself, and uh, and it's easy. And so uh, I, I guess I'm just going to take this moment to announce that this is the last episode of the Dune Steve that I'm going to be doing. Um, so, you know, it, it's been a really good run, and, but it's just too much work, way too much for my shoulders, and... Uh, I mean, not to say that you don't do work, too. You do post the episodes. But, uh... Okay. So, anyhow. I mean, it's been a good run, and uh, and uh, I just wanted to get that out there. And, uh, you know, then we'll s I'll say my goodbyes afterward. But, uh... Okay. <laughs> there, the load is off. You know, the, the, uh... Woo! Flop sweat. Flop sweat. Okay, so, uh, huh. part um... two of... Okay. Of, uh, Ship of Fools by, by Dave Wolverton. I don't think we ever said who wrote it. it uh... I think we did. Okay. Well, this is... You, you kind of surprised me with this announcement. The Rish Outcast, you really, you're really you going to switch over just just to that? That's your plan? Well, it's time for me to go out on, on my own. And uh, and that's working out for me pretty well. I, I, I think I, it's a pretty good show. And, and again, just far fewer hours to get that show done. So... 
And it, I think it's on Stitcher, you said, so. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I put it there. Oh, okay. Okay, David Lee Roth. L- you know, l- l- let me tell you something, Rish. The Rish Outcast, it's a mess. On the Dune Steve, you'll find everything's better than what you'll find on there. The podcasts are always simpler when there is no give and take. You dream about going solo, but that'd be a big mistake. Just think of the show that made you the one with Big Anklovich. It could be past time we paid you, but stop being such a bitch. On the Dune Steve, on the Dune Steve. Outfield it's better for a bed wetter when you're the chief. On your own show there's so much work. Plus I am told the host's a jerk. Your show's in listening. No one is listening on the dune Steve. <laughs> one single host is boring without a partner to share. Hypothetical listeners snoring, no matter how much you swear. Just think of the fun we're sharing when on the Dune Steve you ride. A podcast with no one caring, the next step is suicide. On the Dune Steve, on On the the Dune Steve. Steve. No Paris Sweller without Costello, that joke is deep. We get parsecs every three years. Almost as much resnick appears. No need to choose bad. Don't be a douchebag. On the Dune Steve. On the Dune Steve. On the Dune Steve. On the Dune Steve. Your fan base doubles. Life is the bubbles. Shake like a leaf. Like, like a leafy. Leave your bad podcast all alone. I check the stats and no one's home. Admit that you're smitten with mocking kittens. On the Dune Steve. Who catches barbecue sketches, who wrote gets my goat, needs hears for broken mirrors, who sings bad songs note for note, who's jerking J.M. Perkins, who shows men just Roseman, who bone Mark Ellis Stone. Wait, what? Who job stories about club, who'd bugger old Clay Dugger, who's plinking Brian Lincoln, who bleeps words like fugger, who heard triple word, who nicks politics, who know that last song blow. Yeah. Under Dune Steve. On the Doom Steve. When the podcasts are good while well, they last, no donate, you thief. Just donate, you thief. No need for exodus like Moses. Don't forget who ran anachronosis. Think of what you got. Forget the damn robot. On the Doom Steve. On the Doom Steve. Ignore all the pans. Think of our eight fans. On the Doom Steve. On the Doom Steve. Doing our show's bliss. You love Renee Chambliss, although we're bombing. It's creative common. That's why we hold fast to this old podcast on the Doom Steve. Oh. <sighs> so, what do you think? Okay, folks, uh, two more episodes and then I'm done. <sighs> All right. Well, I think we've left you waiting long enough. Here's part two, Ship of Fools, by David Farland. Urgency swept through him. He wanted to help Emily. He needed to be sure that Baron Blunder was alive. He wanted vengeance. He could not do everything at once. Emily and the prince were far away, but he didn't know where Baron Blunder might be. He decided to check the Great Hall. A satyr's eyes are better than a human's in the dark. Though the night was fast coming to a close, the shadows were deep. He made his way through town, stepping far more quietly than a human could in the snow, for his sharp hooves made little sound. He followed the aide's track back to a servant's entrance at the palace. He pulled open a small door which moaned softly as swollen wood scraped paving stones, and nearly fainted when he spotted a guard in the dark with a dying lamp above him. The guard, a fat sot, sat in a chair by the door, snoring lightly. A huge mug of ale rested at his side, empty. 
erstwhile crept in, closed the door behind, and stole the guard's weapon. A strange long criss made of black metal with a wavy blade. It was something one might use when making a sacrifice. Must be something the prince ordered, erstwhile decided. He was big on theatrics, and the blade had an especially evil look to it. Erstwhile crept down a corridor to the great hall, peered through a curtain. The fires in the hearths had burned down to smoldering embers, and most of the candles in the skulls had been blown out. There was no sign of Baron Blunder or any of the guests. A lone waif bent over a table, scrubbing it clean, humming an old folk tune. I love you and I always will, till the mountains fall forever and the moon stands still. Up on the podium, the prince's dinnerware sat. The golden goblet gleamed in the ruddy light. He gave it to me, erstwhile thought, and then he stole it back and tried to kill me. A murderous rage built. There should be some justice in the world. He'd have to check the roundabout for Baron Blunder. But first, there was a small matter of vengeance. He crept through the room as silently as possible. His hooves made tiny clattering sounds on the marble floor. The waif didn't seem to notice. He reached the podium, climbed the steps, grabbed the heavy flagon. There was a platter and dinnerware olive gold, too. He took the forks and knives, tucked everything into the belt pouch and used the platter as a breastplate. He crept down from the podium, heard the serving girl emit a soft yelp. Oh! He glanced up. She gaped at him, her mouth an O of surprise. With a single leap, he crossed forty feet and drew his black criss, then swung it and stopped the blade an inch from her heart. Quiet! He hissed. Oh! Oh! She said, chest heaving. She looked as if she might faint. She was young, only sixteen, perhaps. She had wheat-colored hair and eyes as blue as robin's eggs. Her skin was pale as cream. And like all serving girls in castles, she had that hand-picked beauty to her, with a doe's legs and lashes, as if one of the prince's guards had spotted her in some village and brought her to the castle to adorn it with beauty and grace. Oh, sir, she begged too loudly. Spare me. Quiet, he demanded again. But, but... She trembled. I know thou art a lowly creature, given to animal pleasures. Tears leaked from the corner of her eyes as she came to a hard choice. Do with me as you will. Satisfy your lusts upon me. But please, please, please let me live. (sighs) Erstwhile groaned. The red priests had done their job well on this one, telling tales about satyrs' unnatural lusts in order to justify the crimes they'd committed. Look, you seem like a sweet girl, erstwhile assured her. And under better circumstances, I might even hope to court you. But right now, I'm looking for a friend of mine. Big fellow. He came in the ship of fools. He left hours ago, she said. All of the bards and fools departed. Soon after you won the goblet. My friend would never have gone without me, erstwhile countered. But... The girl continued, still scared out of her wits. It was said that you took your cup and left. The guards said that they let you out of the city gates. You were afraid that someone might steal your prize. Of course, erstwhile realized. The prince had sought to cover his crime. Half the bards and fools in the country would be hunting him, hoping to relieve erstwhile of the golden cup. Even Baron Blunder... Last I saw Baron Blunder, erstwhile said, he was being held by the guards. They let him go, she said. He stormed off in a rage. He was quite wroth with you. Erstwhile glanced south. Was it true? Had Baron Blunder been persuaded that he was so faithless? It's the horns, he thought. And maybe the tail and hooves. People never trust you if you've got horns and hooves. Erstwhile must have got an angry scowl, for suddenly the wench nearly swooned, 
and he had to grab her with his free hand to keep her from falling. She moaned, eyes half-closed, and begged, Please, sir, take me if you must. Perhaps I'll rip your bodice another time, my lady, erstwhile quipped. But if you could manage to remain quiet for a few minutes, I'd be forever in your debt. Conveniently, she let out a sigh and fell limp. Erstwhile had found that maidens in high society were obliging that way. Swooning was an art form. He went to the guest's cloakroom and found his greatcoat still hanging on its peg. He donned it, pulled the deep hood up to cover his horns, then crept out the way that he'd come, past the sleeping guard, and into a fog that seemed killing cold. He crept in the pre-dawn. Ice crystals entered his open mouth with every breath. The air smelled of fresh bread and firewood, for the bakers were up cooking for the troops. He passed a hovel and heard a baby cry and a mother trying to shush it. Otherwise, the fog and the cold smothered all sound. He wondered how to escape the castle and realized that he'd have to go over the wall. He reached the base of some stairs that led up to a wall walk. A young guard stood there, peering through the mist and darkness. Is someone there? The guard asked. Erstwhile crept closer, then raced forward, threw back his hood, showing his horns and golden eyes. The guard shouted and fumbled for his blade. Erstwhile rammed him with his horns, sent the lad flying. By the time he pulled his sword, Erstwhile was racing up the steps, three at a time. He reached the top of the wall walk just as the guard began shouting. Erstwhile peered down through the fog. Castle Crichton was perched upon a huge crag, a cliff of rock. No human could have hoped to jump from it safely. The first drop over the wall was only 20 feet, and he found a nice little outcrop there, and perhaps four inches of ledge. Beyond that, all was fog. He leapt, landed soundly on the ledge, and slipped on icy stone. He went sliding down a slope, grabbed a small tree, which slowed his fall until it yanked free. He spotted another perch down 12 feet below, leapt for it. A boulder came bouncing past his head, pushed from the wall above. He gave a startled cry, dropped to a tiny ledge, and held his place. Rocks and ice went rolling past. He waited for a few seconds, began taking a circuitous route, bouncing from one tiny outcrop to the next, a feat that only a mountain goat might have managed. Another set of boulders came tumbling through the fog. Shouts of, Get him! rose from the walls. Arrows whizzed past, fired blindly. He raced west a few paces, and in twelve leaps reached the bottom of the hill. The river that might have swirled around it was covered in ice, then topped with drifting snow. The only sign that water lay beneath came from dry cattail rushes that clustered along the banks. Erstwhile feared that it might be too thin to hold his weight. Hooves were great for leaping around on rocks, but tended to split ice like a dagger. Sometimes he wished that he had a human's monstrously oversized feet, as unnatural as they looked in the animal kingdom. There was only one way to test the ice. He leapt as far as he could, landing with a belly flop, sliding. He heard a soft crack and waited to fall. He was only a dozen feet from the far shore. He was painfully aware of the weight of his gold. He swore not to part with it, even if it meant drowning. On hands and knees, he crawled three paces before the ice broke, and he slipped up. Two hours later, erstwhile slogged along a forest road in his wet greatcoat. A thin film of ice had formed outside it, which created a surprisingly nice layer to hold in the warmth. The interior was lined with rabbit fur, and though he felt sopping wet and miserable, he was warm enough. At this rate, he thought, with my body heat, it should take only a few weeks to dry out. What made him more miserable was his thoughts of Emily. The hunting horns had gone silent long ago, which meant that the huntsman had found his quarry. It was not hard to follow Prince Crichton's trail. A dozen hunting horses, 
and thirty dogs will make a mess out of fresh snow. Among their tracks, erstwhile found those of Emily, the bare footprints of a young girl. With the coming of dawn, shadows were fleeing, and the fog began to lift. Stark pines, almost black beneath their mantle of snow, rose up on each side of the trail. Erstwhile had passed through town in the darkness, had spotted the ship of fools outside an inn, but Baron Blunder was nowhere to be seen. Erstwhile hadn't been able to wait for his old friend, so he'd forged ahead. Now, as he topped a hill, he heard the jangle of mail and harnesses, the tired panting of dogs, the clop of hooves. Crichton's hunting party was returning. Erstwhile leapt off the trail, raced a hundred yards, and dove beneath a small pine. The cold needles beneath it carried a musty scent, and he bellied down, tried to see his own tracks. His prints stood out in the snow. His heart pounded in terror as the hunting party came riding into view. Hounds sniffed at his trail. One let out a keening cry. The red priest rode up, peered at Erstwhile's tracks. My lord, he shouted, a stag passed this way, a large one. Shall we give chase? Erstwhile wished that he'd dropped more deer pellets into the man's food. Prince Cryden rode up, resplendent in his black cape and black fishmail armor. He bore a long black hunting lance with blood along its tip. The hounds sniffed at the ground, peered up at their master, tails wagging, eager to be on a new hunt. Cryden's dark eyes flashed. Looks like a trophy, he said, keenly interested. Then his shoulders sagged. But that damn girl wore me out. He turned and rode away, his retainers at his back. Erstwhile found Amelie in the snow, naked, pale from blood loss, and oh, so cold. She had a single wound to the belly, a lance had run her through. She was lying with blood dribbling from her mouth. She had put a bit of snow over the wound as if to staunch it. The rising sun lay hidden beneath a lid of gray clouds, and Amelie looked as if on a bed of swan's down. He blushed to see her pale breasts revealed. To erstwhile surprise, she still breathed. Emily, he cried as he neared, and took off his cloak and laid it over her. My love, she panted. Is that you? She peered out blindly, moaned in pain. <sighs> Stay still, he begged. Can you move? She struggled for breath for a long moment. He caught me. After sunrise, she said blackly, should have, should have let him have me sooner. Emily struggled to lift her head, prop herself up, but a gushing sound alarmed erstwhile. He peeked beneath the robe, saw blood ooze from her wound. He wouldn't be able to move her for fear that she'd bleed out, and he couldn't let her stay lest she die of cold. He took her hand, found it as chill as ice. He struggled to find words to comfort her. None would come. She suddenly looked at him, smiled faintly, her blue eyes seeming to bore into him. Get me to the ship, she said. Dress me. Dress me in my old brown dress. He knew the one. A peasant's dress. The one he'd first seen her in. It was dirty and worn, lying crumpled in a trunk. She hadn't worn it in weeks. I will, he promised. She seemed to pass out. He feared that she would never speak again. Then she roused enough to say, Carry me back to Littleford. To me, Mum. I don't... don't... want to be buried here. Did he... did he ravish you? Erstwhile begged. He hated the Dark Prince, yet somehow he imagined that if he had confirmation of the deed, he could hate the man more. She began panting and suddenly gripped his hand with a ferocious strength. Her back arched. She let out a cry, 
and then a moan, as if she had just had some grand notion. Emily stopped breathing. Her hand fell. Tears threatened to blind erstwhile. Oh, how he fought them. The satyr was holding Emily's hand when the ship of fools came rumbling near an hour later. In the frosty air, erstwhile was shivering, teeth chattering, but he hadn't dared remove his robe from the girl. Instead, he dreamt of vengeance, of what little he might take. We are bought, he told himself. Protected by a brotherhood. This girl was my charge. He knew that wasn't quite right. He was a bard, not Emily. She'd only come to teach him. The fact that he loved her would change nothing in others' eyes. But the prince had stolen Erstwhile's mug, taken his reward, and tried to have him butchered. And for that, the dark prince would be ridiculed and scorned, humiliated in every land. Bards would sing of his base desires. It might not sting much, but who knew? Merchants who might have traveled to the land would now shun it. Lords who might have offered support would turn away. Songs and crude jests had unseated more than one king. As Baron Blunder drove up, Erstwhile did not turn to look at him. He recognized the sound of the pounding hooves of their draft horses, the creak of the axle tree, the squeak of the oversized wheels. All too soon, the baron cried, Whoa! to the horses. He sat for a long minute. When he spoke, his voice was rough with emotion. Poor lass. Think we can bury her in this hard ground? Erstwhile shook his head. I promise to take her home. To her mother. Baron Blunder grunted approvingly. Erstwhile picked up the girl, so small and pliant, and staggered to the wagon. Baron Blunder opened the door, and they laid her upon her bed. Erstwhile found the waif's dress, still dirty and stained, and pulled it onto her, then laid a blanket over her. He wouldn't be able to sleep in the ship tonight. Maybe not for any night that might ever come again. He climbed out and stood in the daylight. Baron Blunder said, They said at the castle that you took your gold then slipped off into the night. Thought I'd never see your tail again. Erstwhile shook his head. It was a lie. The prince stole my prize and tried to have me killed. Baron Blunder said, There's a good song in that. He fell silent. Erstwhile's thoughts were clouded. His men will be hunting me. I had to leap down from the castle wall. Tracking me will not be hard. Erstwhile knew. (laughs) For long hours, Baron Blunder used the lash, sent the horses plodding up little-used roads into remote mountain villages that wouldn't see strangers in a winter. The snow grew deep as they climbed. Yet Erstwhile knew that if they could get high into the mountains, the snow might cover their tracks. The skies were heavy laden, gray as slate, and by midday, snow indeed began to fall. Two hours later, a strong gale kicked up, and big flakes began to swirl around them. The Baron chose strange roads, going ever higher into the mountains. There were no signs to guide him, but he seemed to know the way. He had been at this a lifetime. At last, they reached a fork in the road. One trail climbed, while the other dropped into a serene valley. There were no cottages or fortresses as far as the eye could see, only dark, empty forests and snow falling. Down in the valley, wolves began to howl. Which way? Erstwhile asked. Baron Blunder shrugged. I've been lost for hours. Erstwhile studied the trail helplessly. Baron Blunder urged the horses uphill. Why this way? Erstwhile asked. I'd rather die of frostbite than by wolves. Exhaustion took its toll. As night began to fall, Erstwhile nodded off and woke to find Baron Blunder carrying him, struggling to open the door to the ship. What? What? 
erstwhile asked. Get some rest, Baron Blunder said. I'll drive through the night. He bore erstwhile into the ship, which seemed warm and quiet. Outside, the wind howled. Erstwhile felt dazed. He listened to the shrieking wind and felt desolate. Aren't you going to sleep? Erstwhile asked. Not tonight, Baron Blunder said. I think that we've made it safe. No one's chasing us. Erstwhile's heart ached. He thought, No, we did not make it safe. Amelie did not make it. In the dark, a dream came. Erstwhile was perching upon a snowy crag with the wind swirling around him. Below, the valley was filled with howling wolves. As he trembled, he looked up into the storm and saw something flying toward him. Vast were the wings, with perhaps a hundred spans, and the creature was dark like the clouds at the heart of a hurricane. In seconds it was upon him. A reptilian head, with teeth as sharp as shards of ice. It wheeled, and he smelled the terrifying odor of putrefaction. It was dead, old and odious. The dream dragon laughed as it wheeled, then headed back east. A voice hissed from everywhere and nowhere. Let's hunt begin. Erstwhile woke and knew that it was no normal dream. It had been ascending. The Dark Prince was coming. Midnight found the ship of fools climbing into the forest, struggling through snow. Baron Blunder had taken a lantern, and now he forged ahead of the horses through the storm, lighting the track. Erstwhile drove. A dangerous ledge was to their right, dropping into a forest. To the left was a cliff. Erstwhile had no idea where they were going. He only hoped that somewhere higher in the mountains, the trees might be thick enough to give them shelter. He had no idea that there was a tree line, and that Prince Crichton would give up the chase. Snow was falling, enough to cover their trail. With luck, the strong winds would blow away any traces. Suddenly there was a cracking sound, and the whole wagon tilted. Erstwhile had driven off the road. He imagined the ship of fools plunging down the cliff, and his heart pounded. Everything went into slow motion. He leaned left, tried shifting his weight so the wagon would stop tilting. If it went over, he'd have to jump for safety. For long seconds, the wagon canted, and Baron Blunder rushed back, pulled the horses by the reins, urged them back onto the road. The horses forged, straining and stamping their hooves until the ship righted. Moments later, they rounded a curve and found a mountain crevasse. Tall pines rose up on either side of the road, and Baron Blunder pulled the horses into their shadow. A few feet ahead, trees had been chopped down, but only a few. The road simply ended. We're on a woodsman's trail, Erstwhile realized. We'll stop here, Baron Blunder said unnecessarily, until the storm blows over. The Baron freed the horses from their harnesses, led them into the shelter of the woods, and then started a campfire. He was good with fires, amazing in fact, and soon the two men sat beside a blaze. They had little to eat, only travelers' rough fare. A bit of dark bread, some raw onions, and parsnips. Still, the blaze pushed the shadows of the forest back, and they sat in the warmth of its glow, while flames licked the air and embers went wafting upward, like stars rising into the perfect black of night. A haze of blue smoke soon filled the little glen. They had a glum meal, and long into the night, erstwhile caught Baron Blunder staring at the wagon. They had known each other for so long, they hardly needed to speak. The Baron longed for bed, but would not sleep in the same room with a dead woman. You think he's hunting us? Baron Blunder asked. I know he is, Erstwhile said. 
I had a dream. What kind? I dreamt. Erstwhile said. That I was on a cliff. A dream dragon flew overhead and said. Let the hunt begin. Baron Blunder finished. The fat man looked up sheepishly and shrugged. I had the same dream. Like a daydream only. I felt it in me bones. Do you think you'll find us? Erstwhile asked. The Baron shrugged. They'd done all that they could do. Baron Blunder wasn't the kind to resent fate. A voice boomed through the woods, circling like a hawk, hissing and snarling. I found you! Erstwhile and Baron Blunder leapt to their feet, eyes searching. Erstwhile could see well enough into the darkness. He peered down the road the way that they had come. No one was there. Run! Baron Blunder shouted and turned for the woods. He had not gone a step when a black arrow sprouted from his back. Then two more. He cried out and staggered forward, then dropped to the ground. Hold! Erstwhile shouted. Hold! We're bought. We're under protection of the guild. In that instant, shadows seemed to stretch from the woods to coalesce into shapes. On the road, a dozen mounted men appeared, huntsmen with the dark prince, hounds in spiked collars and leather masks the color of blood lunged forward, barking. The prince laughed. Fool, you think that the guild can help you? Why, you left my castle a day ago, crept out with your reward. And who is to say what happens there, so far in the woods, with only the wolves as your witnesses? Most likely, it was some robbers that found you. The silence had been an illusion, erstwhile realized. Crichton had ridden him down, with huntsmen and horses and dogs. Erstwhile had never heard a sound. Erstwhile peered to his right and left, overwhelmed and confused. What was real and what was not? Were these men any mere phantasms like the dream dragon? So pleasure me, the dark prince said, his voice hissing among the pines and ferns. You will take off your clothes and run. This time... It will be a proper hunt. Erstwhile hesitated. To race through the woods in the dark was a sure way to break a leg or attract wolves. How... how do I know you're even real? He said. Strip off your clothes, Crichton said. He urged his mount forward, stuck his black lance into the satyr's chest. Even through his coat, Erstwhile could feel it. A powerful illusion might show images, even create sounds, but he could not make a spear prick a man. Erstwhile gulped, let his great cloak slide off. He stripped off his tunic, revealing the curly hair on his chest, the belly ring made of Sardakian gold. Now run, the prince hissed. Run for your life. Erstwhile found his nerve. No. He said, Fight me. You're not half the man I am. He grabbed the lance, jerked it. The Dark Prince struggled momentarily, then let go. Erstwhile fell backward into the snow, and the lance went flying. The Dark Prince laughed, drew his great sword. Ha! <laughs> so there is some fight in you, goat man. Erstwhile was on his back. Weaponless and weary to the bone. His friends were dead. If I'm to join them, he thought, I'll give a good accounting. He leapt to his feet, grabbed a burning log from the fire and waved it like a torch, startling the Dark Prince's horse. It reared and the Prince raised his sword, prepared to swing a killing blow. The ship of fools exploded. The side door blew out, 
slamming into the prince, knocking his horse sideways. The prince rolled and leapt to his feet. Dogs snarled and yapped, and the prince's retainers fought to control their own mounts, which neighed and bucked. In the door to the ship, Amelie stood in her dirty dress, which billowed in the stiff wind. She was as pale as ever, and for the first time, erstwhile realized that she had been no paler in death than she had been in life. Her face was a feral mask of rage. She leapt toward the dark prince, arms spread wide, and flew across the clearing. In one swift motion, she twisted his head and ripped it off. As blood gushed up from his carotid artery, spurting into the air, she brought down her mouth. Vampire! A huntsman shouted and taking control of his mount spurred away. The other horses were whinnying in confusion, and in the meager firelight erstwhile spotted the priest, trying to control his horse. Erstwhile leapt past Amelie, then slammed his log into the back of the priest's head, while hounds yelped in terror and raced off into the night, into the storm. A vampire? erstwhile asked later, as he sat beside the fire with Amelie. It made sense now. He remembered how cold her touch had been, and he recalled how, at first, he had been amazed that she would want to join a troop of fools as they traveled the world. Of course she needs to travel. She needs to feed. It explained her penchant for long walks in the moonlight. Yet... He was still amazed. For four years now, Emily admitted. I didn't want to tell you. I was afraid you'd be afraid. The fire crackled, and a log shifted. Sparks began floating toward the heavens, and she took his hand. Her own was very cold. I was afraid, he admitted. That you were afraid. I mean... I'm only half human. She nodded. She looked content, as one does after a full meal. You're man enough for me, she said, but her voice was timid. Am I woman enough for you? He looked into her eyes, and a fire gleamed in them, sparkling, like a pond on a summer's day. You're so alive. I thought you were gone. I needed soil from my homeland, she said. Without it, I was weak. He knew that. It's why he always took off our clothes. Then erstwhile realized. Of course, there had been dirt on that old dress. You gave me my life back, she whispered and leaned forward for a kiss. But just as his lips were about to meet hers... She twisted away, aimed lower, and he felt her tongue moisten his neck. A numbness seemed to spread out from her touch. May I? She asked. It won't hurt. Eternal life. He wondered. With the woman I love, how could it hurt? Hours later... The ship of fools rode down out of the mountains, leaving the heights and the snow behind. For a while, it stopped at a crossroads on the highway, and there, erstwhile pulled the body of the dark prince to a tree and tied it so that he hung from his hands. There should be justice in the world, erstwhile recounted. This man tried to rob me. He killed my friend and tried to eat me. He hunted fair young maidens, making them run naked in the woods. And he called it sport. So erstwhile hung him beside the road. Before he turned away, he cut a couple of stakes from the prince's back strap to eat on the road. He left the dark prince as a warning to would-be tyrants.
All right, so we're back. Uh, wait, wait, hope you guys what, what enjoyed is, that. What What does life as the bubbles mean? You know, I wish I knew. All I can guess is that it's it's a common mermaid slang. It just hasn't made its way into you know human speak because we don't we don't have as much experience with bubbles. You know, kids love bubbles. Well, yeah, I, I wish I loved anything as much as kids love bubbles. Me too. Okay, so a quick cast list. We're not going to really go into it too much because uh, we did it already once last time. And I'm assuming you listened to that. Why would you listen to part two of a story and not part one? That would be weird. Yeah, if those except guys. For, except for unless you're like Harry from When Harry Met Sally, who always reads the last page of every book just in case he dies before he finishes it. That, my friend, is a dark side. That's right. So... I was the scary Count Dracula guy. What was his name, really? Uh, Prince Crichton. Prince Crichton. Rish was our lead character, erstwhile the satyr. Graham Dunlop played the voice of the uh, giant, who was named Baron Blunder, if I uh, recall correctly. It's funny for me to talk like that, I suppose, for people who just finished listening to the story, and I'm like... What was that character's name from the story that we just listened to one minute ago? But for us recording this episode, we recorded the, epi- the, the story months ago. So I have an excuse. But Let's... you did get Graham Dunlop's name correct. I did, yeah. I, and then Ben Gifford did... He did a lot of voices. He was pretty much like every other character. And there was a lot of other characters in here. A lot of little one-line parts. Um, And he basically played all of them. Yes, he's the one that said, Vampire! (laughs) That was it. That was his entire contribution. No, he did uh, a lot of other soldiers, townspeople. Um, He did some of the huzzas, etc. And then, of course, Renee Chambliss was Emily. And she was also the the cleaning woman, not the cleaning, the servant girl. That's right. Who just really wanted you to ravish her for some reason. That was... Well, typecasting, you know. Yeah, she's, she's been uh, so indoctrinated by those darn red priests. So yeah, that was our, our cast for this story. And the real question is, what does life as the bubbles mean? I don't know. I, my guess is that it was just made up for that song. Um, you know, an amazing thing is uh, Dave Wolverton. Dang it. Now, do I have to bleep that every time I say that name? <laughs> I don't think it needs to be bleeped. It's not uh, like saying Fred Garvin or Frank Carvin or whatever his name is over on that other show, is it? No. It is kind of like saying Voldemort, though. You're supposed to just say he who must not be named. Or you can say David Farland. Okay. Which is a little shorter. I will say David Farland. That's like saying the Dark Lord. Right. Uh, he sent us a an author's note. Oh, yeah. Do you remember when we had a show called The Dune Steve and we do author's notes? I do remember It's that. quaint to think back, but still. That was back before the dark times, before the triple word score. Yeah. <laughs> that, that either killed the show or it prolonged the show. Yeah. I, I don't know. It which. made it not die many, 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 many months ago. I'm going to let you read the author's note then. Okay. You ready? Author's note. With Ship of Fools, I was excited to write about a satyr. I wanted a character who was something of a trickster, I think, and he came to me rather quickly. A loner, a creature with special powers and abilities, but one who is in great danger. In coming up with this... I got to thinking about ancient entertainers, bards and jugglers and puppeteers and fools and such, and realized that they might be something like traveling masons in the Middle Ages, protected by their own special laws. But of course, laws only offer protection when they're respected by those in power. I knew that my characters were heading into trouble, and I immediately thought of them on a ship. But it wasn't a ship. Since it was a vessel for members of a fool's guild... I wanted it to be a vessel befitting of fools. So a story was born. The dream dragons in the beginning were taken from a poem that I wrote when I was perhaps 22. And the wicked prince, 
comes from a tale from the 1700s about a prince in England who actually liked to strip peasant girls bare and then hunt them like animals. There is more to this tale, though, I'm afraid. You see, the evil prince in this tale has a father who is far more evil than the son, and he's not a forgiving man. I do hope to write it some day, perhaps just for fun. Dave. Wow, cool. So there could be a sequel to this story. Yeah, you know what would be really neat is if he heard our production, and he's like, oh, I'm going to write the sequel to that, and I never would have done it without, and then he leaves us as something in his will. <laughs> yeah, like the ability to podcast the story. Oh, well, that would be nice, yes. <laughs> uh, but I do think, uh, Dave, did we talk about running into him and and then driving off and laughing and hoping they didn't get our license plate number? <laughs> Uh, let's talk about that again if if we didn't. Just just to remind folks if they'd forgotten. Um, we were at one of them their sci-fi cons. It was it it was just it was a what oh you called it a geek together once. Did I really? I like that. <laughs> you don't even remember calling it that? I don't. I learned the term from you. Did um, I hear it from somewhere else or did I make it up? I don't know. I assumed you'd heard it from somewhere else, but I don't know. Maybe you did make it up. Uh, but yeah, we were at a geek together with many other geeks. Yeah, you know, they always have the big floor with all the booths that has everything in it. And we happened upon Dave Wolverton. Uh, oh, what a giveaway. He who must not be named. We happened upon David Farland's booth. And I believe his booth, his booth was, uh, you know, somewhat touting his writing and he had copies of some of his books there but I think it was mostly just touting writing classes that he was giving online and uh, we talked to him it must have been like 15 minutes or more right yeah I mean I just stood there staring at his hat but I believe you talked to him for a while he's the person that's responsible for unleashing Stephanie Meyer on the world he said yeah he he talked a lot about the, you know the things that you could learn from his classes to the point where I was desperate to sign up for them but also you know i figured while we were there and while we were talking to this guy it's it's our it's our opportunity to uh, ask him if he'd be interested in if he had a story i mean people know dave farland a fair amount i would guess he's a he's a pretty well-known author so i think people would be pretty excited to hear a story from him on our show and so i thought well might as well the worst he could say is no and so I told him about our podcast and told him that, uh, asked him if he would be willing to give us a story, and he was all for it. And uh, yeah, so here we are. Hopefully, we'll get enough donations from this story that I can take those writing classes because they're not for somebody like me with as little uh, disposable income as I have, apparently. <sighs> well, we don't usually ask for donations on this show. Uh, it's something I've always hated, but. Uh... Let's take a, a moment and do that. Yeah, donate to the show so that we can take the writing classes and become as famous as Stephanie Meyer. Because, yeah, apparently Dave Wolverton taught... Ah! Oh, dang it, I did it again. He who must not be named taught English classes, or I guess it was creative writing classes, that... Shoot, who all did he say took his classes? I think Stephanie Meyer was one that he said took it. I think he said... Didn't he say that Brandon Sanderson was also in his classes? That sounds right. It, it seems like there were three. That... And I want to say also the guy that wrote the Maze Runner books, James Dashner, Dashner, was a student of his. And perhaps even that guy that wrote the I Am Not a Serial Killer books. Is that right? Uh, Dan Wells. His name. I think he was also a student of his. I could be wrong, but... I think he and Brandon Sanderson were in his classes like at the same time. If I remember from all the panels that we went to at that geek together. <laughs> so, But he does these writing worksheets. Right, yeah, he does these writing uh, classes. They teach you all about what you got to do to become a, a good writer, a best-selling author. I don't know if that is part of the guarantee, but... Uh, and you can do them online. They're just online workshops and... Yeah, I was really interested by the time we were done talking to him. Well, he had um, a whole list of different, um, what do you call it, 
different subjects that he, he, he did classes on. Is that sound right? Yeah. And there were a bunch where you'd be like, oh, hey, that would be useful. I mean, you know, it's just like one about world building or one about dialogue or one about character or one about publishing or self-publishing or cover art, you know, and all this. And, and I could just be lying and he doesn't have any of these <laughs> topics, but I, I couldn't find the website. So, <laughs> oh, it's mystorydoctor.com. Okay, let's go to that. Okay, let's go to it. There he is wearing that hat. The story puzzle, writing mastery. Promising starts, powerful endings, magnificent middles, rewriting to greatness, kickstart your career, Heinlein's rules, recharging your creative batteries. Ooh, that one you need to go to. Writing for M, G, and Y, A. I mean, there's different stuff. I think there's classes, and then he also has lectures, which are, are much cheaper, and I am assuming all that is is he talks, you watch and listen, and take what you can from it. Whereas the classes, I think he actually treats you like a teacher in a, in a real school would, where he has to read your stuff and tell you what you need to do and, and that kind of thing, tell you where you're weak and where you're strong. And uh, I assume that's what that all is all about. So they seem really cool. I'd really like to do something like that. But yeah, I mean, the story puzzle is 400 bucks. So we need donations, folks. <laughs> so, you know, if you're a writer that wants to maybe learn something, you could check that out. And heck, we did this commercial for him here, not because he asked us to, but just because I guess his pitch at the Geek Together was good enough that uh, I thought it would be worth trying. Well, see, it's always good to go to something where they talk about being creative. They talk about reaching your potential and you're, when you're just surrounded by other creative people. I know I've said that week after week on, sorry, month after month on this show, but uh, just mingling with other people that care about writing or care about publishing or care about art or whatever it is, you can't help but feel it and, and go, oh, I could work harder. I need to work harder. I will work harder. Yeah, it, it gets you excited and it, it helps to recharge your creative batteries. Hey. <laughs> He should do a panel about that. He should do a yeah, lecture about that. Yeah, maybe he will. But yeah, it, it is very cool to have something like that. It, it's helpful because they the batteries run out, man. They they wear down, and it's hard to make yourself do anything sometimes. As far as that goes, and I I suppose that could be part of the reason why this is this episode has been more weeks in coming than it should have been, aside from all the other things that get in the way. But yeah, so. We talked a lot about his writing classes, but we haven't really talked about the story very much. Uh, you spent a large portion of time putting this together. Is there anything that uh, you'd like to talk about? Anything that jumped out in this story that you found interesting, etc.? Well, um, it takes place in a in a world that's much bigger than what we've covered in the story itself uh -huh. and uh, almost to the point where I thought, oh, okay, well maybe, you know, this is a story that takes place in one of Dave Wolvert, uh, <laughs> Lord Voldemort's book series, you know, or this, th he's got a whole series that take place in this world, but it's apparently not. It's just, you know, he, he built a world and he knows more about the world than we do based on his author's note. But, uh, but uh, he's never revisited it. And, that's something that always blows me away. I think we talked about it last time with J.K. Rowling knowing like the histories of all the kids that went to Hogwarts and all sorts of minute details about the past and the four founders of the school and all sorts of stuff that, that very rarely ever comes up in the actual books, but she knows it. And to me, that just that blows my mind that you could create that much, that you could craft that much and then not use it or keep it inside or keep it in a notebook or whatever she's got yeah yeah that's interesting i guess you know having that you can write a sequel have you but yeah this did seem like a really big world sorry you were gonna ask a question Go no, ahead. it doesn't I'll matter right? back to that i was gonna say have you ever written a sequel to something you have written i can't think of something that i wrote a sequel to i guess that's because your characters are always dead i do have end. Yeah, they are dead by the end of each story, so there is that problem. I do have plans for, uh, you know, the, the gauntlet, if that ever gets written, there is supposed to be sequels. 
to that. I'm not telling the whole story in book one. So there's a future of sequels. I know you just wrote a sequel to a story that you wrote. Have you, You've written other sequels as well, though, right? I have, yeah. See, I'm not a fan of the uh, finishing your book with questions still unanswered. I, I, Oh, gosh, I just, I, I hate it. Well, I guess what I'm not a fan of is just ending your book and the story is not done. Apparently you agreed so much you applauded. No, I dropped something. Sorry. Just, yeah, there, there are books, including one by Mr. James Dashner we mentioned a few minutes ago, that uh, you get to the end and it's like, oh, oh, okay, so that wasn't the end. What did you do? What did you do, sir? And uh, But I am a fan of writing self-contained adventures and leaving the door open that, you know, the characters may have more adventures down the road. And I just, that's the kind of series I like. Uh huh. But, you know, to each their own. I, I, we've heard time and time again with publishing, even self publishing, that you got to have this series. You got to hook the, the reader either with your world or with your group of characters and, and have them just salivating to see what happens next to those characters. Um, and that, you know, nobody writes standalone books anymore. Yeah, but you can still write standalone books that. Uh, our, uh, speaking of J.K. Rowling, she's what was the name of her alter ego? The Galbraith? Is it Robert Galbraith? Yeah, Robert Galbraith. She's been putting out standalone books uh, with the characters from that. You know, like you were saying, further adventures of the, the characters. But at the end, you know, they catch whoever or figure out the mystery or whatever it may be. Um, I guess I can agree with you. It's kind of irritating to read a whole book and then just find, oh yeah, that would, and to, I guess to not have a satisfying ending, you read a whole book and then it's like, oh yeah, that was just chapter one of, you know, this huge series or whatever. Um, I remember when I first started reading Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, they had much more ending-worthy endings <laughs> as each chapter finished. But then, as time went on, and, you know, the series grew longer and longer, the endings became less and less satisfying. And it started to just become one endless book instead of 14 separate books. So, yeah, that, that, that I guess that can be... Uh, frustrating i you you don't have to always finish it finish it if you know what i'm saying like batman doesn't kill the joker at the end of every comic book you know when you do something like that that really kind of makes you know the next chapter a lot less exciting when you're like well there's no joker so don't have to worry about that but he does foil the joker's plan or whatever i guess at the end of each book if you know what i'm saying so it gives you a satisfying ending, as it were, without sealing the, the, the door and saying, no, there's no further adventures. It, I guess there, there are two different kinds of TV shows. You know, There's the ones where you can watch them in any order. You can miss a few episodes and you're not lost. And then there's the more, the more serialized TV shows, which is how a lot of things go today. But I find the serialized things way, way more satisfying than the, the episodic things. But in books, I find it the opposite. I, I, I want, when I get to the end of the book, to feel like, okay, you know, and the journey of our heroes pauses now, and we we will catch up with them again at a later date. You know, I, I just, I like that kind of thing. Yeah, you want to hear, this is the end of this chapter in our hero's life, but there will be more chapters to come. You do want it to be the uh, an, an, a satisfying end before you move on. I mean, this story has that. It obviously is not something that is looking forward to a sequel in any way. Uh, when it ends, it ends. I don't know. Sometimes, like, for example, there's those Matrix movies. And I've said this before. I never saw Matrix 2 and 3 because, in my mind, the story was over when Matrix 1 ended. It ended in such a way that I was just like, yeah, no, it's over. It's over. Go home. 
there's no way that they can stop Neo now. He can just see through them. He can do anything. He can take out any agent without even trying. He is the one. And there was no more story to tell. And I was just like, sequel? So I guess maybe there's the possibility that that could happen if you make your ending too satisfying? Yeah, but uh, that's an embarrassment of riches when people are demanding you write another one. They bring out another one and you're like, but I killed Sherlock Holmes because I don't want to write about bloody Sherlock Holmes anymore. And they're like, we don't care. We love Sherlock Holmes. And he's like, all right, here is a whole novel about an earlier adventure of Sherlock Holmes. Now are you satisfied? No. No, we want more Sherlock Holmes and we don't want him to be dead. Okay, I, I you feel bad for a writer who is forced to keep going back to that well. But at the same time, you feel much worse for a writer who nobody knows their name and nobody's right. ever read anything they've written. And nobody wants to hear anything about any of their characters ever again. It's like, yeah, I know you wrote that stuff. We don't, you don't need to do more. We're, we're, we're good with... You, you don't even need to write about other characters. Have you thought about uh, being a truck driver? <laughs> but yeah, it does seem like writing is all about the sequels and the series these days. Well, just, just today... I found a book by Terry Goodkind called Wizard's First Rule. And I texted you and I said, hey, did you have any interest in this book? Do you, would you like me to buy it for you? And you said, oh, yeah, I, will, I would ha buy any. I, what, what is it you, what's the series called? Sword of Truth, I think it's called. Okay. You said, oh, yeah, just get me any Sword of Truth book that you find. And by the end of the day, I had found ten Ten books I bought for you of, in this sort of truth series, that kind of amazes me. And then, yeah, they were too heavy to carry to the car. I had to take a cart <laughs> to the car. Oh, you're just an old man as well. Yeah, they, I was weak as a young man, too. So your nephew was able to carry all... Your five-year-old nephew was able to carry them all out, but, but you needed the car. I see how it worked. <laughs> I've heard that's a good series. That's why I told you to go ahead and get me whatever... So I'm excited to read them. I'm sure it'll take me a while to get... Because those are big books, too. They're not thin, quick reads. Those are thick tomes. So I'm sure it'll take me quite a while to get through all of those. See if I live that long. <laughs> but as, you know, as a writer, it would be great if you had a series like that. And you had fans that were just clamoring for the next one. And it's like, hey, you can't write it fast enough. They People, oh, they just want it so bad. And... My mom was reading this interview with a writer who I think he's on his fifth book in a series. And he used to have a bunch of different, you know, books that he'd put out. But once he started this series, nobody cares about the other stuff. They're just like, no, we just, just write those from now on. And she said that, uh, you know, the first couple were really hard. But by like the third book, he knows these characters so well and he knows the world that they inhabit so well that they basically just write themselves and I thought, wow, what would that be like? Oh, can you imagine? Yeah, I remember you. You're just like, F that guy, and they write themselves. <laughs> Did I say F that guy? Writing should be hard, like it is for me. Did I say that? <laughs> I... No, you wouldn't say something like that's not you do you never tell anybody to F off or F that that's that must have been me that thought that. Well, anyhow, I just I'm envious <laughs> that he's got fans that are just can't wait for the next one to come out, and then I'm envious that he is so immersed in that world in his mind that he just has to go there and write what he sees. You know what I mean? He doesn't... And, and, and yeah, I'm oversimplifying. I'm sure he still has to come up with plots and twists and where he's going and chart a course, and every once in a while he has to scribble that out and start over. But it's an enviable position to be in. I think that would be really neat. It makes me want to be a writer like that and put out series. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's... It's got to be cool to, to know your characters well enough that you can do something like that, too. You can just be like, yeah, no, I, it writes itself because I know Kinsey Milhone that well. Yeah, it's interesting because I've been getting stuff off of Audible recently because I got a free trial and that's the only way I can afford it. But, uh, <laughs> oh, did I mention that we needed donations? Not yet. <laughs> but uh, there is... This uh, this writer that they suggested I might like because I got 
a couple of the John Scalzi books from the uh, Old Man's War world, and I and I think I also was looking at James S. A. Corey's books, which are also space opera type books, and so it suggested, hey, maybe you'd like this guy, and the guy's name is B. V. Larson. I believe he is a self-published author, and he has several series. So I got on here and I looked at his series, and I was just kind of amazed because it says when the books come out, and, and it was just like this book came out, you know, in April of 2014. And then the next book says, and this one came out in June of 2014. And this one came out in September of 2014. And I was just like, holy crap. How does somebody write that many books that fast? And yeah, I mean, they all have like five star ratings mostly, or at least four and a half. I haven't listened to one of them yet, but I'm really, hey, <laughs> he has a book called Outcast. How about that? You know what? F that guy. <laughs> I mean it. It's like I... stealing mine. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you you were the kind of person that would say F that guy. I knew it. But the the thing that you you failed to mention, the thing the thing that I was most blown away by. I know you were blown away that he could write a novel in two months or whatever, but uh, that there were like twenty four hundred reviews. Of his, is that, am I getting it right? Reviews of, of just one of his books. Yeah, yeah, that was true. And I thought, not everybody that reads a book leaves a review. Yeah. Probably on, only one in, let's say one in ten leave a review. The, when I started thinking about how many people had to have read his book, just one of his books, and he has several, that would feed your family. Yeah, definitely. And he's self-published, so he's getting the lion's share of all that money. I, I think the reason his books may be coming out so fast uh, might also be because it's the audiobook that's coming out and not just the book book, you know what I'm saying? If you've got the books all written and then it's like, oh, I need to do audio too, and you get somebody and they just churn through them and then the audios come out, that might be the deal. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's good. See, I need to do that, too. I need to start just churning out audiobooks. Yeah. But I don't. F that guy. I'm, finally, we have something <laughs> we can agree on. I think we've reached the end of our episode, if that's at all possible. I would like to thank you for your song. <laughs> I would You're like welcome. to thank... I'd like to thank you for your song. Well, the donations will thank me for my song. But uh, Dave Wolverton for sharing this. Oh, gosh, I did it again. He who must not be named for sending us this story and letting us podcast it and uh, for that hat. And then, of course, the three voice actors who lent their time so willingly. Uh, so there's that. Yeah, thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for helping if you did. Um, thanks for donating because... I need to get more audiobooks. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be back again. We've got uh, more stories in the pipe. We're almost, we still got a few more of those triple word score stories. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's coming up soon. Check back again. Same, sadly, same bat time and same bat channel. Uh, about five, five weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys all then. Happy holidays, folks. <laughs> Good night. Cheers, guys. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. A lone waif bent over a table, scrubbing it clean, humming an old folk tune. I love you and I... Oh, wait, I'm doing an English, that doesn't matter. And I always will, till the mountains fall forever, and the moon stands still. 
sorry, I've got some thumping about outside. I'm gonna do that again. And my stomach's growling. Okay, oh, I'm gonna keep trying. Hopefully I can get this out between growls. But, the girl. <laughs> I just said, the girl. <laughs> I'm gonna do that last part again. The girl continued, still scared out of her wits. It was said that you took your car, your cup and left. The guard said they let you out to the city gates. You were afraid that someone might steal your prize? Oh, there's a dog. Please, sir, take me if you must. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Uh, erstwhile shouted. Maybe if they streamed it on... Damn, I can never remember the name of that stupid app. Stitcher, that's it. Maybe if they streamed it on Stitcher again. How do you get on Stitcher? You just need a needle and thread and that's all. But did we apply to be on Stitcher? Did we submit the show? Or is that something where they sought us out? They just found us. Like iTunes. I don't think we submitted ourselves to iTunes, did we? It just No, we did with iTunes. I think you have to. Uh, with Stitcher, way back when, like Stitcher is actually less old than our show. Okay, I believe that. So one day we got like an email that said, yeah, your show was on Stitcher. So love us. And I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. I don't know what the heck you are. But I get little emails like that every now and then where some podcast service says, yeah, we've put you on our service. And they're just like, oh, okay, well, I guess more exposure is better than less. And then one day Stitcher sent us a new email saying, okay, well, now that we're hot stuff, you're going to have to apply to be on Stitcher. You're going to have to beg and become a partner and pledge your firstborn. I don't remember what it was, but I was just like, I've never used you once. I don't give a crap. And so we fell off of Stitcher. And then one day, one of our listeners is like, oh, no, you guys aren't on Stitcher anymore. What happened? Oh, I can't listen to a podcast with anything but Stitcher. And I said, oh, yeah, well, I remember they sent us an email and, like, wanted us to do sexual favors for them to be able to stay back on. But I guess I could consider it, but I didn't really do anything about it. And then finally, one day, we went to New Media Expo, and one of the guys there said, you were an idiot if you weren't on Stitcher. And so I decided I'd probably better do that. And so I went back and begged and performed the favors. And now we're back. So there you go. And Stitcher's just an app you can get on your phone. You could do it now that you've come into the future and you have a phone. That's true. I have one of those phones. I, I saved up and I, I wanted to get one of those smartphones so that I could scan those little symbols that were on like posters on on handbills. Uh-huh. And then I found out they don't do those symbols and they don't do handbills anymore. So <laughs> anyhow. Just think of the show that made you the one with Big Anklovich. In blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Almost made it. But uh, you, I think you're a little too big too early. Oh, yeah? You've got nowhere to go, you know, at the end if you're already... Just when on Big Anklovich you were practically shouting and that's kind of how the song ends, so... Okay. Life is the bubbles. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to talk about that after this story, or just what the devil that means. <laughs> okay, I'll go back to the start here again. And, pick I, and I actually, I considered making like a reference to Michael Jackson's bubbles, but it just, it was too many uh, syllables. Michael Jackson has a chimp named Bubbles. Under the sea. Wait, what? Almost sounds like they really said on the dune Steve. <laughs> One single host is boring without a partner to share. Hypothetical listener storing. Ah, uh, I said storing there. Uh. It was Jerk and Jay and Perkins who shows men just Roseman who bone Mark Ellis Stone. Yeah. You know you like that. Wow, did you really did you slow that down like even double? so much but it's still insanely fast even slowed down that much <laughs> you know you know he will <laughs> he's 
just gonna be like, damn it, all right, I'm unfriending these guys. Spirit, hear it under the sea. Whoa, I just burped. That one might be loud on the mic, but you may not have heard it. Hmm. Where is that one you heard? Yeah, I think your neighbors heard it. Yeah, February 22nd. He says he'll have his assistant pull one in the morning on the... I sometimes have my assistant pull one in the morning as well. <laughs> I don't think you can call your left hand your assistant. That's just, you know, trying to trick yourself into thinking that it's someone else. Mirrors who sings bad song. Note for note. Who's jerking James Perkins? Who's showsman? Just Roseman. Ah. Um. Uh. Uh. Um. Uh. Um. Uh. Um. Uh. Duh. Um. Um. Um, um, uh, um, and it just, it, be- um, 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 it's, uh, yeah, um, uh, re- um, 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 I was going to mention that dude. What is that guy's name? What guy? The guy that wrote all those books, like within a day where you were just like your buddy. Somebody Vance. Is it Vance? Wasn't it? I thought it was something Vance, and I searched that, and it came up with some other author named Jance. Oh, okay. Let me try Vance. Jance. That's not a name. That's what I thought. Well, but you don't have to say but, his name. Yeah, but it'll but be... You can just say that you read about a writer and, and that I hate him. Oh, oh, and then I can say F that guy, and, and you'll be like, hey, that doesn't <laughs> sound like you. Oh, it was totally something else. Why did I think it was Vance and you th- thought it was Vance, but it's not? It is Vance. Not even close. The guy- it is Vance. <laughs> the guy's name is B.V. Larson. Bullcrap, it's Vance. <laughs> Why? Why would you and I think that? I don't know. I thought it was J.A. Vance. There, that sounds right. That's who it is. And when I searched J.A. Vance, a woman came up named J.A. Jance. And she has Seattle Police... De- she writes detective novels. Okay, that, that's fine. Weird. Let's get this done, man. It's late. you got to go to sleep. Your wife is getting up any second now. Oh, it is very late, isn't it? It's one seventeen. I didn't think it was that late already. Yeah, the weird... The... the uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I had something that I was totally going to say and I've forgotten it. Damn it. Was it that his name is actually J.A. Vance? <laughs> that's the end oh yeah it is the end our cast list for today goes as follows did you fart i farted so bad it hurt <laughs> oh yikes <laughs> it burns oh man